mention that I'm a lawyer as well, and that's probably for just reason. Uh, the lawyers have not been receiving a lot of good uh, press these days. I uh, was listening to a conference of a few years ago, and the final speaker of the conference, there had been one speaker after another, had addressed this, uh, the audience, and the final speaker of the day was out in the back, as I was, waiting for the conclusion of the speaker just before him. And as he was listening outside the door, there was tremendous applause and then incredible laughter, followed by a period of incredible applause and more laughter and great applause and more laughter. And this was, of course, his responsibility to follow that. And he, he just heard this building and building and building and building. And he thought, how can, I, how can I follow this? And suddenly, there was this enormous, thunderous applause. And he figured, this must be the final ovation for this speaker. And he found out that the speaker was this pert, attractive, powerful, energetic woman who is captivating the audience. A woman with no enemies whatsoever. Her name, all of you know, Mrs. Fields. And, and she gave everyone a cookie as, as her final salvo to the crowd. And he had to follow her. Hey, I had to follow Alan Keyes. I don't, I don't know that I envy me, but actually I do. I'm so excited to be here. In fact, this is all new material. The ink is still wet on these notes. I wanted to do something fresh for all of you today because I wanted to summarize what we've been thinking and saying and dealing with here today. America and the world are in challenging times. These problems that we face are financial, they're spiritual, they're environmental. There is disunity that threatens to tear apart our country. In fact, never before, I think, is Ronald Reagan's famous line more appropriate than today when he said, government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. And this is what we face. Sometimes I, I wish I could be a Will Rogers to our generation. Will Rogers had some wonderful things to say, and here are just a few of them. A fool and his money are soon elected. I, I don't make jokes, jokes, I just watch the government and report the facts. Last year we said things can't go on like this, and they didn't, they got worse. Our Constitution, listen how relevant this was. Will Rogers died in, I think it was about 1933 or something like that, and listen to what he said. Our Constitution protects aliens, drunks, and US senators. <laughs> it's, it's very easy being a humorist when you have the whole government working for you. And finally, he said, the only difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. <laughs> it can't be more relevant than it is today. And we must take these problems seriously. A couple of years ago, my wife Lynn and I live in Santa Barbara, California. And a couple of years ago, we had three fires that hit our little community within a I think it was like a seven month period, three enormous fires. At one point in time in California, we had something like uh, 1,200 fires burning, and the governor declared the fire in Santa Barbara to be the worst of all. And all of the, many of the resources were devoted to the Santa Barbara fire. And that was the fire that we could see from the driveway of our house. It was on the hills right above us, coming down day after day, moving upon us. Any moment, that fire could explode into a firestorm and destroy, consume everything that we had. We spent a couple of days watching the fire, especially at night we could see it, and it was frightening. 
We gathered together our most important possessions, we put them into our cars, and we, we took them to what we thought was a safe location, and we watched that fire move closer and closer and closer to our home. I feel that this is what is happening in the world now. It's like someone took a torch and set it to the world, and the world is now burning. And the fire is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's consuming institutions, it's consuming, it's consuming environment, it's consuming political uh, situations, it's consuming families, it's, it's consuming our justice system, it's consuming so much. And it's starting to go out of control. I wonder if it will consume everything that we have. This fire is burning. Now this is not unexpected. The Bible warned us of this many time ago, many, uh, many years ago, in passages that pastors don't usually preach and that you don't usually start your day in, in Bible study because they're strong passages. But let me share with you just a few of them. John 16, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. John 15, 19, I chose you out of the world because of this. The world hates you. I've often said, if you go through life without making any enemies, there's a good chance that you are not taking a stand for Jesus Christ. I chose you, and because of this, the world hates you. John 15, 20, if they persecuted me, said Jesus, they will also persecute you. Did they persecute Jesus? Yes. Acts 14.22, after he preached, Paul was stoned, dragged out of the city, and left for dead. Paul somehow got up, went back into the city, and, and left, and then the next day or two, he started preaching once again, and he said this, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul is a master of understatement. Go through many hardships? Yeah, I guess so. 2 Timothy 3.12, he writes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I know there are many in this room who have that desire. You would like to live godly in Christ Jesus. The promise is made, you will be persecuted. That's what Don McIlvaney spoke about that earlier. You will be persecuted. And even the earth itself is not exempt the earthquakes and tornadoes and all that we have experienced in the earth, Romans 8, 21 and 22, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay when Christ returns. The whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And so we see the earthquakes, the floods, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, the tidal waves, drought, heat, volcanic eruptions, and oil spills. We see all this. Natural disasters, though, and persecutions and financial challenges and these other things we've been talking about, those are simply symptoms of the problem. Now, Alan just spoke about part of the real problem, and what is it? The real problem is this. We, as human beings, have forgotten the great commandment. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mole, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Honor God. Put him first. Serve other people. Be selfless. Those are the things that Jesus said are the most important. When we don't honor God, when we don't love him, when we elevate ourselves, when we put our self-interest ahead of others, when selfishness takes the place of compassion, that's when we get into trouble. An illustration we have of that is Israel. How many times did God bless Israel? How many times did God pull Israel out of a difficult situation, put her into a good relationship, give her the land, and what did Israel do? It turned its back on God, went the other direction, failed to honor him and acknowledge him. And as a result, judgment came upon the apple of God's eye. Well, if it happens to Israel, can we think we're any different? If we 
continue to ignore God and walk in another direction, if we don't love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we fail to acknowledge our neighbors and love them as ourselves, will God forever tolerate that? So what are we to do? As was mentioned, Francis Schaeffer's famous book, How Should We Then Live? What am I supposed to do? Can I change what's going on in North Korea? Are, are you capable of stopping the development of terrorist weapons in Iran? Who here can bring peace to the Mideast? Who, who's going to resolve the American financial situation? What can you do? Let me give you some thoughts on that. In order to, uh, well, back to the Santa Barbara fire. I know you'll be happy to hear that we weren't burned out of our house. They were able to put out the fire before it got down to us. It was close. It was uh, about as far away as the hotel is across the street from us. It got close to our home. We did evacuate, but we were able to move back. How did they stop it? One of the ways they stopped it was to set a backfire. They set another line of fire. They torched good land in order to put out the fire that was coming down to us. Fire is potent. They fought fire with fire. Fire can be used to destroy, but it can also be used for good. Fire is used for light. It's used for warmth. It's used to cook. It's used to clear fields. It's used to forge new materials. From the very beginning of our country, a sentence developed that is a significant one. It says this, truth is a fire that will consume everything that is false. And that's something that we need to remember. Truth is a fire that will consume everything that is false. So this fire that is burning out of control in the world, we need to set backfires. We need to set fires that will, that will uh, consume that which is false. I want you to put yourself for a moment in the place of the disciples when Jesus Christ left the earth. There were, at that time, it says in the upper room, about 120 people. So imagine you're one of the 120 who was commissioned with the task of spreading this new gospel throughout the whole world. What would you do? Form a committee, of course. But what would that committee do? You don't have jet transportation. You don't have computers. You don't have email. You don't have printing presses, copy machines. You don't have automobiles. You don't have good roads. And you, your task is to take the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole world. There are 120 of you in this little, little town of Jerusalem. You don't have power. What are you going to do? How would you approach it? How would you start? What were they thinking? That was their mission to take the gospel to the whole world, what would you do? I think I would like to do what they did. They faced an impossible task. It was impossible, they couldn't do it, apart from what, remembering what Jesus said to them. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You can't do it, but God can. And you, my disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And they went into the upper room and they started to pray, God, show us your power. God, we can't do it. We, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to act. We're not sure what step to take. You've given us a task and we want to do what's right, but Lord, what should we do? God, you promised your power. We need your power. God, show us your power. And in the upper room, 
on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit as flames of fire descended upon their heads and history changed. The world is totally different today because the Holy Spirit power was poured out upon them. And, and apart from that Holy Spirit power, we have an impossible task. We can't do it on our own. I don't care how skilled you are. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what resources are available to you. You cannot do it apart from the power of God. And what's good news is you can do it with the power of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. With the power of God operating in our lives as we cooperate with God, as we walk with God, as we follow him, he can do incredible things through us. That power is available to us. The same power that was available to the disciples in the upper room then is available to you today. The same power is available. We need to catch on fire. We need to cooperate with God and, to, and with one another and stand up to the challenges and the threats that are surrounding us today. The disciples did it, and look what they accomplished. What could we accomplish if the Holy Spirit, again, poured out his power upon us, if we sought that power and if he, if he allowed us to work together I want to give you an acronym. You know, how do I get this power? Okay, Tim, that's wonderful. How do I get that power? I want to share with you an acronym. Uh, I, uh, I mentioned I, I'm a lawyer, and after law school, we had to pass the bar exam. The uh, bar exam in, in California, where I took it uh, first, I'm, I also took a Colorado bar exam, but the California bar exam, they told us we had to be prepared to respond to 15,000 separate issues. Now, how do you memorize 15,000 issues? Part of it is you just memorize these different facts and you memorize acronyms. And to this day, I remember burglary as the breaking and entering of a dwelling place at night with intent to commit a felony therein. Yeah, it's just totally useless information, but I, I still remember it. So I want to give you an acronym that I hope you'll remember. And the first word in the acronym is PRAY. The disciples, when they saw that they had to do something, they didn't know what to do, and Jesus Jesus left, they went into the upper room and they prayed. Prayer, prayer, prayer. When we don't know what to do, when we don't know where to go, when we don't know what to say, when we don't know what to give, we need to start with prayer. God, I'm concerned. I went to this conference today, earlier today. Lord, I went to a conference and I heard so much and I don't know what to do. God, help me. God, inspire me. Holy Spirit, come upon me. Enable me to find the place I need to be working. How, how do you feel right now? Do you feel depressed or frustrated? Do you feel uh, hopeless? Do you feel cold? When I say the Holy Spirit power working through you, does it do anything to you? If not, pray. If you know Jesus Christ. If you don't know who God is, if you've never made a commitment to him, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment or two, but those of you who know Jesus, if you don't feel some kind of fluttering inside when I mention that, pray. Ask God to give you that passion that drove those early disciples to lead you, to guide you, to motivate you, to inspire you. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to build a fire within you. Lord, I want that Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I want that fire that Tim was talking about. I, I, want, I want my soul on fire. I've experienced it in the past, and I know I need it now. God, give me that fire, I pray. Be such a person. John Haggai was uh, one, he's one who's been very successful in ministry and missions work and in all kinds of projects. He was asked, how is it that you are so successful in all that you do? And his answer was this. He said, when, 
Whenever I have great need, I go into my study and I start thinking about all of my projects. When I get so excited, I can't sit there any longer. I get up and I go tell someone. When you sit there and you're praying and God starts to burn a fire within you, you can't sit there any longer and you want to go tell someone. You want to go get involved. You want to go take on a project. You want to get going. But it starts with that prayer. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. It starts with a time of quiet reflection. Be still. Other translations say, let go, relax, cease striving, stop doing, and know that I am God. That's where it starts, in prayer. Know that I am God. Take time to be with God and let the Holy Spirit lead and empower you. You shall receive power. This is a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer me, but answer to yourself. Do you believe it? Do you believe that you can receive power to set a fire in your heart where God, who's greater than this world, will work with you to accomplish eternal good in the lives of people? If you don't believe that, pray about it. Take time to have the fire set in your own life. Second is obey. Move forward when he does set those urges, when he starts to answer, when he gives you those responses. Start obeying. Some time ago, last year, I realized that all of my life, the Holy Spirit has been answering my prayers in ways that I wasn't sure of, and, 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 and I hadn't been responding to them. By that I mean, I think these urges, these, these feelings that we sometimes have are the Holy Spirit prodding us to move, telling us to walk in a direction, giving us, giving us answers, helping us move. But it's not a major. It, it's not the, the telegram that comes from God. It's, it's not the, the Rolls Royce that suddenly appears in my front yard. It's just this little urging. And I started praying, God, Give me the ability, the urgency to start acting when you give me that urge, to know that I should be acting and moving forward. Just little steps of obedience. Obey, obey. Sometimes the odds seem overwhelming. You've been given a task, but the odds are overwhelming. You've been given a duty, but the task is too great, and you cannot do it. But God just says, hey, just take that first step. That's all I ask you to do. Just take that first step. Take that second step and let it lay out before you. I want to tell you a personal story. I moved here with my wife in 1975. And I told my wife, we were newlyweds, and I told her we'd come out of a big church and we were in a huge singles ministry. And I told her, uh, honey, we're going to start our marriage right. We're going to get involved in a little church and, and kind of in family ministry. I started my time in seminary. I left Washington, D.C. I was a lawyer with the federal government there, and we left there to go to seminary. I came to Denver Seminary. As we drove across the country, I said, we're going to get into a little church where we'll get involved with other couples and we'll start to develop our marriage. Turned out, I got a job as an intern pastor at one of the largest churches of America to the singles group. Didn't exactly do what I was intending to do. God had something else in mind for me. Terry Hall and Gary Charles were two of the singles in that group. And they got married. They became two of the best friends we've ever had in our lives. They had two kids. We were there probably within an hour after Jason was born. And the greatest gift that Gary ever received from his wife, Terry, was Gary was a fan of the New England Patriots and Terry had the baby just minutes before kickoff, and Gary could watch the game in the recovery room. He was able to be there. Gary and Terry, two sons, Jason and Micah, some time ago, in prayer and in obedience, 
they decided, let's put on a conference. The task is too big. You can't do that. Terry, if you had called me, I'd have told you you were foolish. You can't do this, it's too big, start small. They went in obedience. And that's Gary and Terry, and that's Jason. Is Mike in here? Back here? Upstairs? There's Micah up there. Folks, these four people act in prayer and acted in obedience. And thank you guys for doing it and giving us an example of people who are doing just what I'm saying. When the Holy Spirit builds a fire in you and you act appropriately, this is the result. Thank you for that. I appreciate it so much. So, obey. And then trust, trust, believe that God will guide, protect, provide, empower, trust that he is sovereign, God is in charge. He's the one who has, he is overseeing the Middle East, he's overseeing the White House, he's in charge of the situation, he knows what's going on. He knows what's happening in your life, your marriage, your children, your health, your finances, God is sovereign, we have to trust that. If you're a follower of God, you have to trust that these things are so. Trust that he, he is there and in charge. We don't see it that way sometimes, but we have to trust that God has his plan and his purpose in mind, and we need to trust that. One of the great American heroes that we have today is Admiral Jim Stockdale. He was the highest ranking, uh, uh, highest ranking American captured during the Vietnam War, an admiral. He was captured and spent eight years in brutal captivity in North Vietnam. During that time, he was beaten. Uh, he never knew his fate. He didn't know if he'd ever have a means of escape. He spent eight years there. He was permanently crippled as a result of his being captured. How could you survive such an ordeal? He was asked that question, and his response, uh, his response I, I want to share with you. He said, I never lost faith in the end of the story. Who didn't survive, he was asked. And this will surprise you. Who didn't survive? The ones who didn't survive, he said, were the optimists. The optimists didn't survive. Why not? Because they denied what was going on around them. They said, it's okay, we're going to be free by Christmas. Christmas came and left, and they said, that's okay. By Easter, we're going to be free. Easter came and went. By Thanksgiving, we're going to be out of here. And Thanksgiving came and left. By Christmas, and Christmas came and left. And the next Christmas came and left. And they died, he said, of broken hearts. And then he said this. This is a very important lesson. I'm quoting him. You must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end with a need for discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. There are brutal facts confronting you right now, facts that are painful, that are difficult, that are challenging, but we can never forget the end. In the end, Jesus Christ returns. He establishes his peace. He, the just shall be rewarded. The unrighteous will be dealt with appropriately. That's the end. And so we focus on the end, but in the meantime, we have discipline to confront the daily challenges of life, and we can do that only through trust. Some are saying today, it's all okay. We're in recovery. It's going to be great. Don't you worry about it. We have hope and change, but their hope is in the wrong source. And unless your hope is in Jesus Christ, you're going to be let down. Pray, obedience, trust, serve. Serve. Paul writes, 2 Timothy 1.6, fan into flame, burning, fan into flame, the gift of grace which is within you. How do you fan it into flame? Through action, through service, through stepping forward. The tendency of fire is to go out. If it's not tended, if it's not fed, if it's not, if you don't, pay attention to it, it'll go out. If we don't use the gifts that God gives us, if we don't take advantage of the opportunities, why should God continue to grant us his gifts? Get involved, don't sit back, act, go about it. 
But uh, let me just take a little bit of a digression here, and I want to say this. When you do act and when you do serve, do it with joy. Do it with happiness. Do it with a light attitude, with a spirit. Dick Cavett, the, uh, the show host, he said he had a problem with the religious right. He said, they never laugh. Well, Dick Cavett has never spent time with my family. Uh, Irma Bombeck, the humorist, she wrote this. She was in church one day, and a little boy was a couple of rows in front of her. And he was looking around the church, and he was smiling at the people. He had a big smile on his face. He was nodding at people and smiling. She said he made no sound. He was no distraction. He wasn't laughing. He wasn't pointing. He wasn't, he wasn't doing anything other than smiling. His mother, in a whisper loud enough to be heard by Irma, said to him, stop that. She grabbed him, she threw him around, and she smacked him until tears came down his face. And she said, there, that's better. That's better? It's better to have a crying son than a smiling son? Billy Graham, well, I, my, my point is, who wants to follow that kind of example? Who wants to be the one where Dick Cavett says they never smile, they never laugh? Billy Graham said this, the world today is again in desperate need of a spiritual awakening. It is the only hope for the survival of the human race. There are certainly many instances of Christians who have been touched by God and are in turn touching the lives of others for Christ. But for every instance of that, there are many more Christians who are living defeated, joyless lives. These people have no sense of victory over sin or effectiveness in witnessing. They have little impact on those around them for the sake of the gospel. I don't want to be like that. I want a person who brings joy and happiness and mirth and, and delight and, and fulfillment and satisfaction into the, into the world. And fortunately, I had a great example. I had my dad. My dad was a wonderful example of that. He had a terrific sense of humor. He was generous to a fault, literally to a fault. I would love to have had an inheritance, but he gave it all away. <laughs> my dad is not an opera kind of guy. One day, my uh, mom convinced him to go to the San Francisco Opera. So dad is sitting there waiting for the thing to start, and he's fidgeting, and he's uncomfortable, and thinking, what am I doing here? Total believer in Jesus Christ, total disbeliever in the concept of Dick Cavett. My dad went out. He came back a few minutes later with his coat over his arm because underneath his coat, he brought in to the San Francisco Opera a watermelon. <laughs> Took the watermelon as the lights are going down and the opera is starting, and he handed it to my mother. So she's got this watermelon on her lap, and she said, what am I supposed to do with this? And he turned to her and said, pass it on. <laughs> so she took the watermelon, handed it to the person next to her and said, pass it on. <laughs> that watermelon, back and forth, back and forth. And they could watch the teetering heads ahead of them as people obviously were getting that watermelon. That was my dad. He was one who knew how to have a good time, knew how to spread joy. He was one who passionately, on fire, gave his life to Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to be doing, serving with passion and with joy. Pray, obey, trust, serve, and yield. Yield. If you're one who does not know Jesus Christ, if you've never yielded your life to him, do it today. You could talk to me or any of the speakers, the, the staff that's been here today. Just yield. You're not going to be able to face these things on your own. Yield. Jesus, I need someone in my life to guide me. I'm not getting anywhere on my own. I pray that you will be my guide. Help me understand you better, know you more. Just pray that prayer and start following Jesus. Yield to him. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, yield totally to him. All I have, all I am, my skill, my talent, my time, my resources, they're, they're going to be burned up anyway. You might as well go out hand in hand with the Lord, following him, heart on fire, burning in passion with him. Yield to him 
It's an acronym I just gave you. What's the acronym? Pray, obey, trust, serve, yield. Potsy. Potsy. I don't know what that means. You can figure out how to use that, but it makes it easier to remember. Potsy. Be a potsy person. I'm a potsy for Christ. I don't know. I've never seen a bumper sticker or a T-shirt. Potsy. Pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit will set your soul on fire. Obey him when he, when he causes you to move out of your comfort zone. Obey. Trust. Trust him for the outcome. Serve him. Get out there and start doing what he's called you to do. Yield totally to him. Be a potsy Christian. David Brainerd was. He was a missionary to the American Indians, and he prayed for that fire. Here's his prayer. Oh, that I might be a flaming fire in the service of the Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me to the ends of the earth. Send me from all that is called earthly comfort. Send me even to death itself, if it be in your service and to promote your kingdom. Could you pray that prayer? Could you honestly go before God himself and say that? I don't want to read that again and just think about this. Because God will take you seriously. Oh, that I might be a flaming fire in the service of the Lord. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me to the ends of the earth. Send me from all that is called earthly comfort. Send me even to death itself, if it be in your service, and to promote your kingdom. I believe the early disciples prayed a prayer just like that. And as a result, the gospel has gone throughout the world. Are you really concerned about what's happening in America and the world today? George Whitfield had a huge impact on America. The Great Awakening and so much of the good that came in America is laid at the feet of George Whitfield. He is one who had a flaming heart for Christ. He apparently had an incredible gift of speaking in the open air fields where 50,000 people at a time, it was said, could hear him speak. What a voice he must have had. Benjamin Franklin is one of the followers of George Whitfield, and Benjamin Franklin confessed he often went to hear George Whitfield speak because he could watch him burn before his very eyes. He watched him burn. That's what drew him out. Jeremiah, the prophet, suffered greatly because God had called him. Jeremiah had no followers. He was taunted. He was jailed, he was beaten, he was thrown into stocks, his life was threatened, and in fact, an attempt was made on his life, and he got discouraged, as anyone would in that situation, and he decided, I'm done with this, I'm through, God, I know you called me to this, but I'm done. I'm through speaking out. It's just, it's not worth it anymore. And then he writes this in Jeremiah 29, but if I say, I will never mention the Lord or speak in his name. His word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like a fire in my bones, and I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I cannot do it. Because the heart, his heart had been set on fire by the Holy Spirit, and he couldn't keep it in, no matter no matter what the results were, he trusted God and he gave himself totally to him. Charles Spurgeon plead, pleaded for people who were on fire. Spurgeon, we still use many of his sermons today, one of the great preachers, one of the great evangelists the world has ever known, Charles Spurgeon. He wrote this, we need leaders who live only for Christ and desire nothing but opportunities for promoting his glory, for spreading his truth. We need red hot, white hot men who glow with intense heat, whom you can't approach without feeling that your heart is growing warmer. Men like thunderbolts flung from Jehovah's hand, crashing through every opposing thing till they have reached the target aimed at, men impelled by omnipotence. That's what we need today. That's my prayer for the people in this room, that your hearts will be set on fire, that you'll become red hot, white hot, men and women who go forward led by the God of all omnipotence. I don't know what the near future holds, but I know who holds the future, the omnipotent God. 
Oh God, may we burn white hot with the willingness to cooperate with Almighty God in showing his glory to a world in such desperate times. Amen.